Hello everyone. This story is about, what if Naruto and Hinata started living together after she was kicked out of the Hyuga clan? Please like, share and subscribe. Now let's start. Uzumaki Naruto, in spite of his hyperactivity, was actually a very laid-back individual. He enjoyed going with the flow and also tried to see the best in people. Naruto was still starved for positive attention, even though Hinata's presence had filled that void with her warm and comforting presence. Right now, there was something setting Naruto on edge. The clients weren't even trying to hide their whispers. It annoyed Naruto that they were speaking a very weird language, but he knew exactly what they were doing. They were judging Hinata-chan. Every action and word they said was putting Naruto on guard. He was patrolling near the center of the procession and decided to approach Gai-sensei. The last time Naruto had needed to talk to his sensei in private, Gai-sensei had given good advice. Naruto could definitely use some right now. It had been a day and a half since Team 9 and the pilgrims had left Kanoha. Currently, they were resting so that the pilgrims could have their daily prayers. If Naruto was going to get Gai-sensei's advice, this was his best shot. Hey, Gai-sensei, can I talk to you for a bit? Naruto asked quietly. My guy read the situation and nodded. The experienced taijutsu expert led Naruto away from the pilgrims, Lee, and even Hinata. Kanoha sublime green beast knew Naruto needed to speak in confidence. What is it, Naruto? Is everything all right? The blonde-haired boy shrugged his shoulders. I guess. The clients are just putting me a bit on edge. A few of them keep scoping Hinata-chan, and I'm starting to worry. I have noticed their curiosity as well. Naruto, I know that the will of fire would drive you protect your teammates without orders, but be prepared for anything, Guy ordered. He leaned in closer. The Hyuga Junjutsu is almost unheard of outside of Kanoha. We must assume they are after the Byakugan. Naruto nodded, and his face became hard. He wasn't going to let anyone lay a hand on his partner. Iruka was moving through the forests of Hai no Kuni at a speed he had never achieved before. The Hokage had summoned Iruka and informed him of an urgent Birank mission. The former teacher had not even had time to say goodbye to Ayam or Mizuki. A genentine got in over their head. I hope I get there in time, Iruka thought. There was a pit of terror weighing heavily in his stomach. The teacher could not deny or rule out the possibility that he was rushing to save students he had taught in the academy. The prospective special Jonan recalled the mission details as he tried to push through the fog of his worry and raging emotion. Team 12 had been delivering a small relic to the village of Akaraka Nawana that had recently been restored in Kanoha. The message Hokage-sama received from the Jonan sensei had reported that a small group of missing Nin from the Sugi village had taken refuge in the town. They had attacked the Kanoha shinobi, believing that Team 12 had been sent to track them down. Team 12 did very well, but they were outnumbered. I'm glad none of the team were killed, Iruka thought as he caught sight of the outline of the village's buildings against the rising sun. The Chinan stopped leaping through the forest canopy and approached the village on foot. One of the civilian gate guards saw him approach and held out his hand. Iruka halted, as ordered. The situation was dangerous already, and he didn't want to complicate the matter. Shinobi-san, the gate guard began in a nervous tone. Welcome to the town of Akaraka Nawana. One of the genin is waiting inside the gatehouse. She will speak with you and confirm your identity. Iruka nodded and followed the guard into the small gatehouse. The genin immediately perked up when she saw Iruka. Iruka-sensei? What are you doing here? Hello, Manami. Hokage-sama sent me as backup. I know what you're thinking. Why did Hokage-sama send Iruka-sensei? I'm being promoted to Jonin, and the Hokage felt my barrier ninjutsu would be helpful. How do you always do that? Manami asked with a mix of humor and annoyance. The prospective Tokabetsu Jonin grinned. Whenever you are trying to figure something out, you always trace your right earlobe with your ring finger. Manami squeaked out an O. Oh. The town's guard was convinced that the newly arrived ninja and the silver headed young lady knew each other. He nodded and returned to his post. I'm glad you're here, Iruka-sensei, Manami admitted. 
Irika had only been her teacher for a half year, but he had made a powerful impact in a short time. Taiki Kuen is patrolling with Yuto Sensei. What about Akihito? Irika asked. Manami smiled a bit. He's doing okay. Akihito Kuen keeps joking that his girlfriend Shirori will probably like the scar because it'll make him more manly. Sounds like he isn't too badly hurt? Irika followed up. The doctor in this town did a really good job. Akihito Kuen isn't in any condition to fight, but he'll be okay. That doton technique went clean through his shoulder, but missed the bone, the kunoichi explained. The chinin nodded. I'm glad to hear he will recover. Now, what's the current situation? Manami briefed Irika on the situation as best she could. The girl repeated a few of the details Irika already knew, but the teacher was glad Manami was being thorough. The most important information Manami provided was that the missing mean were Chinin level and specialized in Dotan and Suetun Jetsus. The Suetun user would be a larger threat in the current environment. Akiraka Nawana was located on a river a few miles down from an ancient dam. The Nukunens would be able to use their jutsu with far less drain on their chakra reserves thanks to the large amount of water available. How did the Nukunen escape? Irika asked. Manami looked relieved that her team wasn't being blamed for allowing the escape. We had just delivered the relic to the chapel when the town's elder invited us to a dinner. Pretty much everyone in the town showed up. One of the counselors announced we were skilled shinobi from Kanoha, and that's when all hell broke loose. The missing mean thought the meal was a trap and panicked? Irika posed a theory. Yes sir, Manami confirmed. The woman started prepping a ninjutsu. Taiki Kuen, well, he jumped in front of the village head and started casting a jinjutsu to protect the civilians and the team. Akihito Kuen and Yuto Sensei immediately tried to engage the other missing mean in taijutsu. I used my doton, Doria Hiki, to provide protection for the fleeing civilians. You all did a very good job, Irika, praised the genin. When will Yuto Sensei return? He left about two hours ago. I think he'll be back so that Taiki Kuen can rest. Irika smiled at the young woman. I'd like to meet with the villagers and get a feel for the lay of the land. We can wait for your teammate and sensei there. Sure thing, Irika sensei, Manami replied. Irika steeled his resolve as he headed towards the community center. His presence was as much a reassurance for Akaraka Nawana as it was to support Team 12. Irika could not show worry. All he could show was confidence. The spirit of a town depended on it. Hinata deactivated her Byakugan with a smile gracing her lips. The mission was going very well. The former Hugo was proving to be a valuable asset on the mission, and the clients were especially gracious. One of the priests had been surprised that a shinobi knew of the old faith. The conversation had been pleasant and Hanada enjoyed the feeling earned from impressing someone. It was an uplifting experience. She constantly felt as if she impressed Naruto Kuen. The acceptance still warmed her heart, but had begun to feel expected. It was comfortable. This feeling was fresh and definitely helped solidify her self-esteem. Hey, Hinata-chan! Naruto called out. Hinata smiled. Naruto Kuen's enthusiasm and care may be expected, but she treasured it beyond anything else. In some ways, Naruto Kuen's presence in Hinata's life was as necessary as air. Good evening, Naruto Kuen, Hinata returned the greeting. How is the camp set up progressing? It's great, Naruto confirmed. Gai Sensei is overseeing everything. Hinata nodded. Suddenly, Naruto locked eyes with Hinata. The intensity was unlike anything she had seen in Naruto. It was simultaneously protective and supportive. Hinata-chan, I know you can handle yourself, but I've noticed the clients judging you. I, I wanted you to know that I'll always have your back. Your support is why I have made it this far. I, I treasure that while you've been there for me, you haven't smothered me. Naruto-kun, even though we've been living together in your home, I felt like I have been living my own life. Thank you. To be honest, Naruto began. Until you moved in, my apartment felt less like a home and more like a place I just slept at. 
It always feels empty without you in it. Our apartment is the truest home I have ever known, Hinata agreed. Naruto decided to change the subject. He was glad Hinata was affirming his own thoughts, but something about the conversation felt almost melancholy. So, have the clients been judging you? Naruto asked. Hinata shook her head. I don't think so. They seem to be amazed that someone outside of the old faith is even aware of its existence. I think one tried to convert me earlier, Hinata finished with a laugh. You should have heard him talk about how the moon is sacred and reflects the beauty or sins of mankind. So, the moon is like a mirror that reflects beauty and goodness? Naruto asked. I suppose so yes, Hinata confirmed. Well, it's definitely reflecting you, Naruto said. You're more beautiful than the moon. The declaration was so heartfelt, so simple, and so Naruto that Hinata nearly cried. She almost heard another declaration in the words. The unspoken possibility simultaneously frightened, elated, and comforted Hinata. T thank you, Naruto Kuen. Why you are like the moon, too. You were my light during a very dark emotional and spiritual night. In that moment, Naruto and Hinata were unaware of the wider world. It was nearly perfect. Unfortunately, nothing perfect can last. Excuse me, Shinobi-san and Kunoichi-san. Naruto groaned. He felt like something had been building. At least the pilgrim running towards them looked friendly enough. Ikemusai-sama has invited all of your team to dine with him. He has sent me to escort you to his tent. That sounds good. Naruto was happy to have something other than rations. An actual semi-home-cooked meal sounded really good. We would be honored, Hinata replied with a bow. If whatever that moment was had to get interrupted, there are a lot worse ways, Naruto admitted. The two genin followed the pilgrim, whose name they didn't catch, back to the leader's tent. Lee was waiting outside with a warm smile. Gai-sensei is already inside. I felt it would be polite to wait for my teammates. Thanks a ton, Lee, Naruto responded. Team 9 headed into the tent together. The smells. Oh man, whoever cooked, did a great job. Naruto thought. He caught sight of a small grill and couldn't deny that even the vegetables looked appetizing. Yash, my students. Let us thank our clients for the generous and youthful hospitality. My guy flashed a thumbs up at his gen and team. The three young people enthusiastically thanked their clients. Ikemusai laughed heartily as the hungry genin tore into the food. I remember when I was their age. I didn't think there was enough food in the world. The religious leader laughed and offered Lee another helping of food. The taijutsu-focused shinobi graciously accepted the meal. Guy laughed as well. I was the same. My students are in the springtime of their metabolism. The older men and women enjoyed the levity the shinobi provided. Naruto decided to jumpstart the conversation. I bet you guys have seen a whole lot of really cool places. We have been blessed to see a great deal of creation, Ikemusai, confirmed. Is there a place you would like to hear about? Have you ever been to the beach? Naruto asked. That was one place he'd always wanted to go. The idea of the ocean sounded really cool. Ikemusai smiled. We have been to several beaches. One of my favorites is in the Land of Wind. It is very far to the south, past the desert. The sands are as white as the clouds of a peaceful day, and the water is as blue as your eyes, young man. It is a beautiful place, the fact that I meet my partner there, well. Added bonus? Naruto questioned. The old man laughed. Added bonus. Ikemusai san. May I ask if you have ever been to the city of Katanahoshi? Lee asked excitedly. Oh yes, it is a fantastic city. Possibly the finest in the land of mountains. I hope you get the chance to visit it one day. The city itself is carved into the mountain. The architects created a true wonder of the world. But I'm sure you were more curious if I have been there during the great tournament. I have, and it is as incredible as you imagine. The rest of the meal passed in excited tales of travel dreams, and plans for the rest of the journey. Naruto felt his concerns melt away. With clients this nice, what could possibly go wrong? 
Yuto sensei sat down across from Irika in the community's tavern. Akihito may have found our enemy. Akihito found the nuke mean? Irika asked as he sat down his chopsticks. Seems an old codger in this village has a bit of a hobby. Stargazing. Akihito decided to try his hand at it. He noticed some smoke near the dam. The dam. Irika leaned back in his chair. There, could be hostages. I believe so. We'll have to strike quickly. I want us to take the lead on securing the hostages. My genin can prevent the remaining Nikonins from escaping. I'm glad you have faith in your team, Irika complimented. When do we move out? For hours, Yuto said emphatically. There is no one who is the master of a forest at night, like a Kanoha, Shinobi. These Sugi village upstarts think they are talented in forest combat. We'll show them who the true masters of the woods are. Of course, Irika agreed. The next hour was spent with the genin of Team 12. Manami retrieved the blueprints for the dam from the village elder. Every detail of the dam and the surrounding countryside was committed to memory. The two ways the missing mean will try to escape are here, Akihito said as he pointed to one spot on the map. And here. I agree. Taiki gazed at the map. I'm worried about the supports mentioned in that maintenance report. Odds are the missing mean have rigged them with explosive tags, Irika complained. We need to be prepared for that. MHMPH, Manami made a hurt noise. They are so selfish. Blowing the dam would not only kill the hostages they may have, but would make the village unlivable for years. Yudo shook his head. These Nukunans aren't thinking rationally. According to both the citizens of Akaraka Nawana and the Bingo Book, our targets are lovers fleeing the male's arranged marriage. If they can't escape, we must be prepared for a suicidal act. I can't believe anyone can be that desperate, Taiki whispered. It's the fate of Nukunans, Irika explained sadly. Shinobi villages and clans cannot allow their secrets to fall outside of their control. Missing Nin, Nukunans, are constantly hunted. Our foes probably felt they had finally found someplace safe after years on the run. You guys spooked them and they simply panicked. Man, if they had just kept their heads down, we'd have moved on and not been any the wiser. Akihito rubbed at his wounded shoulder. They'll pay for that mistake, Manami declared. They attacked us and put dozens of people in danger. Manami and Taiki, prepare for combat. Akihito, you still haven't recovered enough. I need you in that observatory. Yudo pulled out a radio headset out of a storage scroll. Channel 4. Keep us updated. Yes sir. The three genin acknowledged their sensei and scurried off to prepare. You should be proud of your team. They are handling this situation well. Irika watched as the team left. I am proud of them. Honestly, I'd let these Nukunans go, as they barely rate a C-rank missing means, but there are six people who work at the dam missing. If these two hadn't taken hostages. But they have, and they need to be brought to justice for it, Irika reminded the Jonin. The teacher just hoped that his allies would make it out of the coming battle unharmed. The Junrei Shinoi Otoko was a common path for trade caravans and pilgrimages. Great wealth flowed through the mountain passes. The potential wealth was very attractive for bandits, and armed gangs infested the mountain passes. Merchants, travelers, and religious pilgrims dedicated a portion of their budgets for hiring shinobi cells or conventional mercenary companies for protection. A common question asked by many civilians was why the shinobi villages near the mountains, Kanoha, Kusa, Taki, and AIM or an enterprising band of mercenaries didn't simply wipe out the bandit infestation. The reason was simple, money. Escort missions were a regular source of income for the villages, particularly Kusagakure and Amagekure. It would not be financially viable to wipe out the bandit lairs. The search and destroy missions were also very manpower intensive. Shinobi would not only have to root the bandits out of their caves and rugged hamlets, they would have to occupy the territory to prevent looting. There were only three scenarios where a village would move in and wipe out bandits. The first was if a missing or nuke mean took public control of a bandit clan. The second was for revenge if the bandits killed a shinobi of the village. Finally, the shinobi villages would be extremely merciless in the event of war. 
Kanoha especially would brook no threat to its supply lines if the Fourth Great Shinobi War erupted. These factors led to the creation of an odd parasitic-slash-symbiotic relationship in the mountains. Only the bold, stupid, or desperate bandit clans would dream of attacking a shinobi-escorted caravan or group of travelers. Mercenary companies understood that any attack was just business. The shinobi villages held grudges. Currently, an upstart bandit clan was preparing to assault a large procession of pilgrims escorted by three shinobi, children really, and the most ridiculous-looking old man anyone had ever seen. The bandits' clothes were a mishmash of styles copied from noble houses and famous mercenaries. He had shaved his hair, from his mother's side, to avoid embarrassment. In place of his odd-colored locks, he had extensive tribal-style tattoos. Captain Shinichiku. Our scouts are back. We'll be in perfect position for an ambush. This'll put us on the map. We kill those shinobi and rob the pilgrims, and soon we'll be extorting protection money from the nearby villages. I told you, boys. I'm going to make us princes. Shinichiku declared. The 29 bandits roared as they got into position. Shinichiku laughed to himself, I'm going to live like a king. Rock Lee sighed and shook his head. I do not believe our future adversaries have a concept of stealth. Even if Hinata-chan hadn't been tracking their scouts, there's no way we'd not be on alert after that, Naruto added. There was a clear edge of adrenaline and nerves in the young man's voice. This was the lead-up to their first real combat. Hinata toyed with her fingers. It was a nervous habit Naruto had seen a few times. W. We have trained for this. Team 9, Gai-sensei said in the most serious voice his students had ever heard from their beloved sensei. You have trained hard. I am proud of all of your hard work. Most importantly, I am proud of your teamwork, flames of youth, and will of fire. Ikemusai and his partner were standing next to Gai-sensei. You will have our prayers as well. Thank you all, Naruto found his voice first. Hinata bowed politely. We will not let you down. Gai-sensei. Ikemusai-san. I swear on the flames of my youth that I will help my teammates defend you all splendidly. Mike Guy stood straight and entered into his goodest of good guy poses. I will stand beside you in the upcoming battle. I have complete faith in your abilities, but I must help safeguard the boundless potential you, my precious students, possess. The enemy's numbers are great. However, if we stand together we will prevail. Our flames of youth will become a raging inferno and cleanse these mountains of our foes. The speech was so very guy sensei. The members of Team 9 couldn't imagine any other pep talk from their teacher and felt their spirits buoyed by his very presence. Irika substituted with a metal desk as the water bullet crashed into the wall behind him. The hostage rescue operation was clearly snafu, situation normal, all fouled up. First, there were no hostages. The dam operators were working with the Sugi village Nukunans. Yuto and Irika had been greeted by dozens of crossbow bolts upon their arrival. One of the engineers had rigged up a very inventive, quasi-automated turret. That man, Takeo Irika half recalled, might receive a D-rank entry in a bingo book. He wasn't a shinobi, but his design had been inventive and dangerous. If he sold his design to other villages or organizations, it could cause Kanoha a few headaches in the future. They had been resting and preparing to flee, Irika mentally complained as the woman, who Irika now knew, was named Tsubame. Through seemingly every shuriken in this region of the Land of Fire at the Chinan. Irika countered with a few kunai of his own. Irika had a strategy behind his throws. Two of his kunai had flash tags wrapped around the handles. The fairly expensive tags had few injutsu formulas that primed the tags to activate once the kunai hit something. Irika managed to close his eyes just as the kunai struck the wall. Subame cried out in shock as the tags blinded her for a moment. Irika took the initiative and charged. The Kanoha Chinan landed a solid kick to Tsubame's core. The young woman gasped as the breath was knocked out of her. Surrender, Irika barked an order. Esso we can go back to the Sugi village to die? You didn't have to come here. Tsubame yelled back. Sui Tun, Tepuo. 
The simple D-rank supplementary jutsu did little more than knock Irika backwards, but it allowed Tsubane to escape through a nearby door. Crap. Irika grumbled as he got to his feet. A series of rumbling crashes latched Irika into place. Shit. If there was ever an occasion to upgrade a curse word, it was this situation. Tsubame, Kichiro, and their accomplices had detonated the explosives on the dam. The teacher rushed to the location of the explosives he had seen and desperately wished the new Kneen hadn't used their explosive tags. The Sugi village had always been skilled in creating tamper-proof explosive tags. Only Jiraiya-sama, or maybe one day Naruto could deal with those seals, Irika complained silently. Much to Irika's horror, the supports were giving way. A collapse at the dam would kill hundreds and displace thousands. Yuto. The Nukunans detonated some explosive tags, the dam structure is damaged. Irika called into the radio. Confirmed. Engaging missing Nin, Yuto replied tersely. The Chunin cut the connection. Yuto couldn't afford any distractions. Neither could Irika. Truly, Dotan, Doria Hiki would be the perfect jutsu to shore up the dam. The Earth-style wall would be the simplest way to prevent a catastrophic destruction. Sadly, Irika's jutsu arsenal was limited to the Academy 3, a handful of barrier ninjutsu, and two jinjutsu. The only barrier ninjutsu that would be of any use was the Iankarosu Fusa. It was a basic barrier, but had the advantage of adhering directly to the target. The jutsu would strengthen the supports. That would be the easy part. No point in waiting, Irika declared to himself. He flashed through the hand seals and reinforced the structural integrity of the dam supports. Barrier ninjutsu wasn't designed for this particular use, but the teacher at heart had no other options. The sixth and final support had used most of Irika's chakra. IIV never used this much chakra before. Irika slipped to his knees as his entire body burned from the strain of using the Iankarosu Fusa so many times. As he felt the dizziness of chakra exhaustion set in, a new wave of terror filled his core. The groaning of metal refilled the chamber. Irika's iron cloth blockade was holding. This was much, much worse. The water was putting strain on the weakened section Irika was in. Driven by sheer determination, Irika attempted another Iankarosu Fusa. His chakra coils screamed in protest. The wall was no longer on the verge of collapse. Irika, however, could barely keep physical contact with the wall to maintain his Iankarosu Fusa active. Shinobi aren't supposed to put compassion over the mission, a voice behind Irika sneered. The Kanoha Chinin maintained contact with the wall. He wasn't sure if his jutsu could remain active without a constant influx of chakra. Out of the corner of his eye, Irika noticed Takeo aiming a crossbow at Irika's back. I guess I'm a terrible shinobi then, Irika snarked. Takeo glared at the chinin. You'll be a dead shinobi. This should have been easy, but they had to send the one ninja who would put such a piece of shit Hamlet survival higher than taking out two Nukunans. Now, I'm going to have to get another round of cosmetic surgery to hide from another ninja village. Why do you assholes have to be so persistent? Irika was sure that there was a perfect witty one-liner for this situation. He just couldn't think of one in his current state. Takeo mumbled, screw it, under his breath and prepared to fire. At this range, Irika couldn't dodge and without much chakra the odds of him substituting without hand seals was very low. The expected whistling of a flying bolt never materialized. Instead, Takeo gasped and fell to the ground with an audible crash. Hold on, Kanoha-san, a second completely unexpected voice from behind Irika called out. The voice was somewhat muffled, probably by a mask. It was becoming difficult for Irika to see due to his physical, mental, and chakra exhaustion. The shinobi was clearly wearing a blue robe, a baggy brown outfit under the robe, and a Kirigikyur Hunterneen mask. The Hunterneen pressed his hands against the wall. Almost instantaneously, the entire wall was reinforced with ice. My ice will remain for three days. W what about my comrades? Irika asked after releasing his iron cloth blockade. The hunter Neen sighed. I only caught a glimpse of the battle. My target was the talkative terrorist who nearly killed you. 
The Genin were defending the Jonin after he took a severe blow. He should survive, but the two missing Nin escaped. Damn, Irika hissed. They are going to be okay? I believe so, the mysterious hunter Nin assured the Kanoha Chinin. I must collect my target. The villagers will be arriving shortly to assist you. How do you know that? Irika asked. It was obvious that the hunter Nin was smiling behind his or her mask, the gender of the Kiri Shinobi was hard to tell as Irika had never encountered someone who broadcast so many mixed signals. I have my ways. Irika watched as the hunter Nin collected Takeo and Shun shined away in a flurry of snow and frost. This mission definitely earned its rank. Irika thought as he collapsed on the ground. Team 9 had used Hinata's Byakugan to coordinate their response to the 30 bandits stalking their clients. Hinata reported that the bandits were armed with a variety of simple weapons ranging from knuckle dusters and clubs to hatchets and the occasional ill-maintained sword. Hinata, how are the enemy forces organized? Might Guy asked. Hinata focused her Byakugan on a few enemy groups. The enemy is divided into four groups. The largest group is the best equipped. There are a dozen men in that group. Swords and hatchets? The sensei asked. Hinata nodded in confirmation. And the other groups? There is a group of six bandits approaching on our left flank. Lightly armed, no substantial armor. There are two other groups of six similarly equipped, trying to encircle us. The group approaching to the rear has one well-equipped soldier. How well armored are some of the flanking groups? Naruto asked. Hinata focused again. The right flanking group has simple leather armor. The left flanking group, almost nothing. Okay, Naruto acknowledged. I think I should take the armored group. My ninjutsu can punch through the armor quickly. Least Taijutsu can wreck the other guys. What about Hinata? What role will she play? Lee was curious to see what Naruto was planning. Hinata-chan can deal with the bandits trying to attack us from behind. Armor means squat against her gentle fist. She'll also be able to protect the pilgrims. They like her the most anyway. Hinata-chan, you can keep them calm. Mike Guy smiled. It was good to see the team working together so well. We must take our positions. Hinata quickly approached the pilgrims and informed them of the incoming attack. The clients were amazed by Hinata's Byakugan. A few of the pilgrims had heard rumors of the Byakugan's abilities. Actually seeing the abilities was far more incredible than any rumor. Hinata desperately tried to project confidence. The former Hyuga tried to emulate Lee, Gai-sensei, and Naruto's boundless confidence. This is my first battle as a shinobi. I can do this. I have to do this. My teammates, innocent people, and my future are depending on what I do here. I cannot fail. The six bandits were being led by a garishly dressed captain. His style seemed to be simply lifted from whatever local fashions were popular at the time. He carried a large pole arm and brandished it like a conductor's baton. Two of the bandits threw their lone javelins at Hinata. The Kunoichi didn't even need her Byakugan to see that the throws were wildly inaccurate. It was one of the worst intimidation tactics Hinata had ever seen. The first bandit reached Hinata and smiled lecherously. I don't think we should kill this one. We could make a pretty penny off her. A wave of horror and revulsion swept through Hinata. As her mind processed the words of the bandit, a white-hot rage mingled with her fear. She would not be taken. The women in the pilgrim's procession would not be taken. Hack Kusho! Hinata screamed. The wall of chakra-infused air struck Hinata's target with a level of raw fury Hinata never expected. The Hyuga art sent the man flying. Hinata heard the crack as the man's head hit a rock. Her Byakugan gave Hinata a terrifying view of the criminal's limited chakra fade away. The man's life simply faded away. W what the hell? One of the bandits exclaimed in fear. She's just a girl. What the hell? You're right she's just a girl. We have numbers. The leader barked. Kill the wench. The criminals exchanged a wary glance at each other. They seemingly took strength in their remaining numbers, before charging. 
Their leader stayed back, a nervous bead of sweat working its way down his cheek. Lee smiled as he blocked the lazy swipe of one of his opponent's clubs. Even though the enemy was using a wooden weapon, Lee barely felt the impact. His training with Gai-sensei had been far more intense. Gai-sensei had also been free of any foreign substances that clouded his mind and slowed his actions. It was shameful how someone could willfully poison their body, to such a degree. Lee decided to quickly end the confrontation with such an affront to youth. He didn't waste energy with a fancy kick. Instead, he simply struck the enemy with a back fist. This combat move allowed Lee to position himself to counter the charge of another bandit. The Taijutsu specialist's front kick hit true. There was no hiding the sound of breaking ribs or the gasping cry of pain. Psychological warfare was a valuable shinobi tool. Rock Lee lacked the capability to use Jinjutsu or Ninjutsu. He did not lack the mindset to be a proper shinobi. The young man knew exactly what effect his brutal hit and his unerring smile was having on his opponents. The momentum of the remaining four bandits was ebbing away. Lee decided to redouble his efforts. A quick jump kick knocked one bandit unconscious. A flurry of jabs rendered the fourth bandit little more than a groaning mound of pain. The fifth and sixth bandits turned and ran. Lee simply dealt with them with a simple kick and punch to the back of the head. Victory was his. Naruto flashed through the hand seals for Katan, Eden, as the six bandits charged his position. They were screaming obscenity laced battle cries. The young shinobi had never heard any talk so vile. His main influences and exposure to adults were good examples the third Hokage, Old Man Tuchi, Iruka Sensei, Ayamwani Chan, and Gai Sensei. These were terrible examples of adults. Naruto knew that he was facing an enemy. The bandits would hurt, rob, do other horrible things, even kill his clients. They would kill him without hesitation. They would kill Gai-sensei, Lee, and Ikamusai, without even pausing to think about their actions. They would kill Hanada-chan. There was no way in any hell Naruto would fail his friends. A strange feeling worked his way into his chakra as Naruto fired off his jutsu for the first time in anger. His intended target got incredibly lucky and tripped. The fireball passed over his prone form and struck the raving bandit behind him. Naruto would remember the scream and the sound for the rest of his days. The flames were fueled by chakra. They burned for a long time at much higher temperatures than normal. He. He can breathe fire, a bandit shouted. In a panic, he threw his knife at Naruto. The shinobi dodged the clumsy throw and activated one of his launcher seals with a pulse of chakra. Naruto's launcher seal sent half a dozen kunai firing form the palm of his hands. The storm of metal hit true. Two kunai embedded themselves in the panicked man's neck. He collapsed to the ground with a gurgled scream. A third bandit lost his mind. His screams vaguely resembled words. His swings vaguely resembled attacks. Naruto put an end to his ravings with a kick to the knee and a pair of jabs to the head. The remaining three bandits paused in their assault. He's just a kid. How the hell is he even real? Another growled. The fourth simply turned tail and ran. You coward. The other two counted to three at the same time. Naruto was really starting to wonder if they had been drinking before the battle. They advanced uphill against Naruto. It was almost comically easy for Naruto to finish hand seals for Katan, Eden, before his enemies came within 20 feet of his position. Naruto only needed one more use of his jutsu to eliminate his final enemies. The two bandits were so close together that the fire released jutsu hit both men. This time, Naruto didn't spare a second glance to the corpses. He had other concerns. He had to know if Hinata chan was okay. Hinata used her chakra hari to slow the charge of the bandits. She aimed for the thighs, knees, and gut. Her chakra needles, the jutsu Gai sensei had taught her, were basically more damaging Senban. They could not kill under most circumstances. Hinata didn't expect her jutsu to kill. She only needed to limit their maneuverability. Her greatest strengths was how her agility and chakra control allowed her to apply her jiken techniques with devastating effect. Hinata had another talent that increased the efficiency of her limited gentle fist knowledge. 
the Kunoichi had been studying to become a medical ninja. Her knowledge of anatomy surpassed any of her peers. The first bandit was dispatched with a palm bottom. Hinata strike transmitted chakra directly into the man's heart and lungs. It was brutal, but that was the original, the true, purpose of Jukun. That was the reason the gentle fist was feared. Hinata vaguely recalled that some in the Hyuga had started to focus on the gentle fist's ability to shut down Tenketsu and disrupt chakra. That particular focus was likely an attempt to position the Hyuga clan as a replacement for the Echiha in Kanoha's military police. A bandit swung wildly with a farming sickle. Hinata dodged it, but the garishly dressed bandit captain managed to slash Hinata's shoulder. If it wasn't for my Byakugan, I would have been cut in the neck. Hinata realized, with a horrible dropping feeling in her stomach. Her fear honed her senses and helped her achieve greater clarity with her bloodline than ever in her life. Hinata knocked one charging bandit away with a sweep kick. Die you little demon! Hinata heard one of her enemies shout. Saru Inu, Hinata finished the two hand seals required for her chakra hari. She fired off the needle over her shoulder. With her Byakugan, she could see the enemy as clearly as if he was standing in front of her. Hinata had aimed for center mass, but the enemy made an unusual choice. He was halfway through settling into a horse stance. His mouth was open in preparation for another insult. The chakra needle entered his gaping maw and pierced his brain. He dropped like a sack of rocks. There aren't enough Rio on the planet worth this. One bandit shouted. He turned to run, but the captain cut him down. I'm not going to have my reputation hurt like that. The captain flicked the blood off his short sword. He glared at Hinata. I was going to take you, but I think I'd get more fame by killing you. Hinata glared at the hateful man. She slipped into a standard Jukun stance. The man spit in annoyance at Hinata's lack of verbal retort. He raised his sword above his head in an odd stance. Hinata didn't wait for her enemy to make the first move. She hated all the killing she had been doing. However, this man and his forces would not stop preying on innocent people. They were less like people and more like rabid wolves. Hinata slid at the man's ankles and upended him. She locked eyes with her opponent and saw the unadulterated terror in the man's eyes. There was rage and denial as well. I was destined for greatness. Not to be humiliated by a girl. Shinichika raged. Those would be his last thoughts as Hinata hit his heart with a concentrated Jukin strike. The force of the strike, her own slide, and Shinichiku's position prevented the dead man from landing on Hinata. Hinata-chan. Naruto's voice rang out. Are you okay? Hinata lay on the ground, breathing heavily. She was exhausted. Now that she was coming off her adrenaline rush, the emotional strain was as great as her physical and chakra exhaustion. I, I am not hurt, but I'm not sure, Hinata confessed. She knew one thing for sure, Naruto Kuen and her team would be there for her. It was a long three days for Team 9. Gai-sensei and Ikimusai had talked to each of the genin. The gesture was greatly appreciated, but Naruto and Hinata really wanted to talk to Arika-sensei. Still, Naruto and Hinata were very thankful for the support of their team and clients. The shrine wasn't what Team 9 had been expecting. Naruto and Lee had made a wager that it'd be a large pagoda or a shrine complex. It was neither. Instead of a massive building, there was an island in the middle of a large crater lake. On the island was a series of standing stones. Team 9 accompanied a kamusai to a small baroque-style building at the edge of the island. The old man smiled broadly. Our congregation is beyond grateful for your efforts, Shinobi of Kanoha. We shall never forget that you were more than paid escorts. I will record your efforts into the histories of our congregation. Yash. It was not just our duty, but our youthful pleasure to defend you. Guy replied to the kind words. The three genin of Team 9 smiled at the words Ikamusai offered. Now, I am not sure if this is against the regulations of your village, but I would like to offer a simple gift to each of you. Ikamusai stated cautiously. Guy flashed a thumbs up. It is legal. There are no regulations that prevent clients from showing their gratitude for a job accomplished with unusual youthfulness. Excellent. Ikamusai clapped his hands. 
Now, Li San. My partner, Tomio, informed me that you are an avid fisherman when not on duty. Is that true? Yes, Ikimusai san. I enjoy fishing a great deal. Li confirmed. Ikimusai went to a cart and selected a scroll. This is a tide chart for the coast of the Land of Fire. I hope that you have occasion to use it. This is an incredibly thoughtful gift. You have my sincere thanks. Li responded with tears of sincere joy forming at the corners of his eye. The pilgrim smiled at Li's enthusiasm. Tomio was particularly amused, and his laughter was a match for Guy's, at its heartiest. Uzumaki Naruto, Ikimusai, pronounced. I remember the conversation we had after my prayers, two nights ago. You mentioned that you are a student of the shinobi art of Hyuinjutsu, we have several books on the shinobi arts. A few of our congregation were once shinobi candidates, after all. This is a book we received in a trade with a group of merchants from the land of copper a few years ago. It is worn out, and I feel its spirit would be much happier being used for its original purpose rather than sitting in an aging crate. One of the pilgrims, a younger man stepped forward. Ikimusai-sama, are you sure we cannot give him one of the other books? You are aware that I am from the land of copper. That book is of great sentimental value to me. Hayato Kuen, I know you are a person who values his connection to the past. You were once a Shinobi Academy student in Ishigekure. There is a conclave of our faith, coming up soon in that land. You will have a chance to form meaningful new memories. Perhaps, we can stop by your home village. Ikimusai's smile never wavered. I, I was unaware I would have the chance to go home, the now named Hayato admitted. I would still request that I keep the book. It is one of my treasured personal items. Ikimusai's smile remained, but it became that of a teacher. All things are transient. Only the spiritual world, which one day we may be honored with entry, is permanent. This book is paper and ink. What is important to you isn't the material. It is the psychic. It is the memories you possess. Treasure memories. They are all we can carry with us into the real of spirit. I, I have much to learn it seems, Hayato accepted Ikimusai's position. I will strive to create memories, starting today. I'll let you in on a little secret. I'm always learning. For example, I'm still trying to learn how I put up with Tomio after all these years. Ikimusai joked. Tomio, cried out with a jokingly indignant, oi. Ikimusai handed the book over to Naruto. The young man's face lit up at the gift. This is awesome. I'll remember this gift. Thank you so much, Ikimusai-san. Guy, Hinata, and Lee blinked at Naruto using the correct honorific for someone. That rarely happens so quickly. Generally, Naruto had to really warm up to someone to add an honorific to their name or create a nickname for them. The priest turned to Hinata next. Hinata-san. Thank you for your efforts against the enemy captain. I also appreciate knowing that our faith is still remembered by the world at large. This book is a history of our faith. I ask that you help keep us from being forgotten. This is a book of medicinal plants. Several of our young people mentioned hearing you discuss a medical ointment. Yes, Hinata said as she accepted the two books. My dream is to be a medic neen. I created the ointment to help recover from some intense spars in my past. I humbly accept the gift of the botany book. As for the book on your faith's history, I am honored that you have selected me to keep your memory alive. After one final meal with their clients, Team 9 returned home. Their mission had been a complete success, but they couldn't help but realize how it had changed them. The genin of Team 9 were truly shinobi for the first time in their lives. This was all for now. Thank you for watching, I hope you liked it and that you will be back for more. Please like, share and subscribe. See ya!